Hi, welcome to the uh, Transcript Enhanced Placement Webinar, March 24th, uh, 2012. Uh, I'm going to start with introductions, uh, both of uh, myself and my co-presenter, John Hess. Uh, an introduction to the project, uh, then hand it over to John for him to describe the Long Beach City College uh, data module uh, for this project, and then we'll have a, a wrap-up. Uh, so my name uh, is Terrence Wills. I'm with the uh, Research and Planning Group for California Community Colleges. And uh, John, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm John Hetz. I'm the Director of Institutional Research at Long Beach City College. Great. Uh, so this uh, project, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, it's about um, a feasibility study to see the extent to which uh, high school information can be used uh, as a uh, large component of your placement system. Uh, the idea is that the information from uh, high school transcripts, their grades, and their CSP scores um, from prior studies sufficiently predictive uh, of future college success to, success to suggest that they could be used um, as a, a very uh, a key component of your placement system for recent high school graduates. Uh, some of the prior work on this uh, was done using the, uh, the CalPass uh, longitudinal data system where uh, Craig Hayward, uh, who's on the line uh, from Cabrillo and myself and Eden Dahlstrom, uh, we did a statewide uh, study uh, looking at the correlation between uh, high school uh, performance and college performance in the first English and math classes, uh, including um, uh, predictors of college readiness uh, um, of high school students uh, using those correlation techniques. Uh, and so that was based on uh, as a, a statewide CalPATS uh, a study uh, using the shared data between the colleges and the high schools. There was a, a replication of that study at uh, uh, Chasey College by uh, Keith Wirtz and, and Jim Philpott. Uh, and then there was another, um, what I would term the most exciting uh, replication of that at a local level um, by Long Beach City College, where it was also uh, followed up by and significant policy shifts in their placement processes uh, that John will be describing in more detail. And so this project is um, uh, to help uh, coordinate all of our activities. Uh, you all have been invited to uh, replicate uh, John uh, and his crew's analysis on, uh, on the uh, relationship between your high school uh, uh, information and college performance to help inform uh, refinements to your placement system to help students place um, appropriately uh, to, to get further into the curriculum right off the bat uh, to um, increase success rates and throughput rates uh, to uh, transfer and graduation. Uh, this is very much a grassroots uh, user-driven project. There's not a lot of external funding for this. Um, my role is to help coordinate these activities, be available for questions, either about the CalPass data uh, or um, uh, the project uh, timelines. And then John uh, and his crew are providing a lot of technical support on the uh, implementation <coughs> of the module to, to do your data downloads and to do the analysis. What we're asking the participants to provide back in return are um, your um, your SPSS uh, outputs from your findings so that we can aggregate them and do a meta-analysis, again, uh, uh, keeping uh, in confidence uh, your, your college names and also protecting uh, student privacy. Uh, and in addition, uh, asking you to uh, respond to one, uh, probably more likely two implementation surveys over the course of the next year to uh, address the, the impact of your findings and what policy shifts there have been and uh, changes to uh, uh, student placement and, and progress. Uh, so before I hand it over to John, um, let me just, uh, and I know I've been communicating with a lot of you already about uh, the CalPass downloads and we'll work in the CalPass team uh, to help uh, 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 you all be able to get your, your, your data. Um, are there any questions about um, the structure right now before I hand it over to John for the um, for his comments? Uh, 
And again, you can use either the chat box that I'll be monitoring, or you can you know, raise your hand virtually or, or unmute. Okay. So with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop. You're going to see the screen flicker a little bit. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and John, I'm going to hand it over, uh, hand the controls over to you. Okay. Hi, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope uh, all of you are uh, having a great week prior to Memorial Day. Um, we're very excited. We just had graduation yesterday, and so uh, you know everyone gets to take a breath. Um, what I'm going to try and do today is walk you through. Um, why we undertook this project, what we found, uh, and the tool that our research analyst, Andrew Flynn-Mayor, built so that everyone can do the same project as us in a fraction of the time. Um, I think if everything goes swimmingly, the amount of time that you will have to actually spend on the building the data set and doing the analysis should be less than a day. Um, now, if things don't go swimmingly, or there's very specific things to, uh, that are relevant to your institution, um, it might take longer. Uh, and on the back end, it will certainly take longer. That is, once you've done this, I think you'll find that you will end up with an incredibly rich data set that you will continue to want to use and understand and um, build out into other aspects of your institution. So uh, let me just kind of walk you through why we undertook the project, uh, what we're seeing so far uh, for uh, what we're anticipating for fall 2012, and then I'll walk you through the tool a little bit. Um, a lot of this is built into the present or was built into the presentation that's already available at the RP website. Um, it's based on the presentation that Andrew did at the RP conference in April. Uh, so if uh, I'll probably go slightly quickly because I assume some of you have seen it, some of you have read it already. Um, if there are any point questions that you have, just you know throw up your hand by clicking on that little hand button. Uh, we'll try and watch that, and uh, or just unmute and say, "Hey, stop! Uh, I don't understand." Or you can just say, "Hey, stop! Um, you confused me." If you would prefer to put the blame on me, that's fine. Um, okay, so. Why did we start, what, what made us look at this project? We've been uh, planning a, uh, essentially a large first year experience for our largest institutional partner, our largest K-12 partner, for about two years. And uh, what our goal was, was to take advantage of some of the things that that partner was doing and provide a set of streamlined prescribed paths preferably ones that would align with um, the different small learning communities that they have, the different academies that they have, so that students who are doing uh, near college level work or college level work can move directly into coursework that's aligned with their interests and what they've been doing in high school. Um, and the first step for us was to try and understand the relationship between high school course performance uh, and how students are assessed and placed when they come to us and how they perform in our courses uh, when they come to us. So um, what we did, and um, we'll step you through the process in a minute, um, is we, with the help of Calp House, built a five-year cohort of over 7,000 students from our largest local school district uh, to try and answer three questions. Uh, what predicts how students from this district assess and place in target developmental course sequences? Uh, and what predicts how students actually perform in those courses once they're there. Uh, and then the secondary question that combines the two of them, how well are those things aligned? Is it the case that the things that are predicting how students assess or where they place, are they similar to how they perform in the classrooms? Or is it the case that the performance is related to factors that we're not capturing in the assessment? Um, so normally in PowerPoint, this comes out all in little pieces, so it's all mysterious and you know builds suspense. So you'll have to pretend like this is coming out a little bit of a time if you want that suspense. Um, but basically, what we did is we just ran uh, ordinal logistic and logistic regression for English and math. And what we first tried to do was predict um, how students place into uh, our English sequence and how students perform in our English courses. And the strongest predictor of 
uh, of how students play is their score on their 11th grade California standards test, English and language arts exam. Not their, they don't take it in 12th grade, it's their 11th grade CST, and uh, it's very highly correlated with their performance on our standardized assessment. Their grade in 12th grade has no relationship to their placement. Uh, their overall GPA has a moderate uh, relationship. But what you can see is that when you look at how they perform in the courses, right, and we take into account course difficulty, um, how they, how they uh, performed on that standardized assessment had virtually no relationship with how they performed in the course. How they perform in English is largely a function of how they did in English in high school and their overall GPA, much better predictors. The uh, pattern for math is slightly different, but uh, on the whole generally similar. A uh, couple of other variables come into play. Um, so but again, one of the biggest predictors is of how they place in our developmental coursework in math is their performance on their last um, math California standards test. Right? So it's not just 11th grade. Some of them don't have 11th grade math class, so they wouldn't have a CST result. So it could be a 10th grade, and even in some cases a 9th grade California standards test result. Um, their overall math GPA almost makes it to significance, doesn't quite, um, but their 12th grade GPA doesn't matter, their 11th grade GPA doesn't matter um, for how they place in our math sequence. But in terms of how they do once they're in it, their overall GPA matters a lot, their math GPA matters, and their, their overall uh, assessment in math still matters a little bit. But you can see that those things don't match very well. Right? In placement, we're entirely or almost entirely weighting um, the standardized assessment, right? because that's the method that we use. Uh, we have a question. Yes, Tom? Yes? Um, this is Tiffany Jordan from uh, Fresno City College. I have one question about the, uh, the data. Uh, the CPA, you have an uh, app there, but does that mean it's actually significant, right? Right, so that, that's the X's, if you look at the bottom, those P's are significant uh, in far beyond what we can tell. So it's P less than 1 times 10 to the minus 10. Okay, so, okay. That should be like a four star, right? Well, it's more than four stars, right? It's like eight stars. And actually okay. some of those, not on this one, but on this one, if I recall correctly, this, uh, this one right here, that one is actually P is less than 1 times 10 to the minus 104. So, yeah, so they're, 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 they're very significant. Okay, all right. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, right, so what we have is a system that's not very well locked. Right? We have a system where the assessment mechanism at our college very um, strongly weights a standardized assessment, which doesn't seem very related to how students actually perform in the classroom. It is related, right? It's not that it's not related, and in the absence of other information, it's still useful. But when you have other information, right, it pales in comparison. So what has that meant for us? So what, that, what that's meant is after a great deal of institutional discussion, we came up with two different pilots for uh, a small cohort, oh, uh, depending on your definition, a small cohort or a large cohort, roughly in the neighborhood of 1,200 to 1,400 students coming from this district in fall 2012, um, we are going to have pilot uh, placements available in English and math. So for English, um, what the English department decided on was that any student receives an A or B in English uh, in their senior year, uh, that is, and as long as it's not a remedial English course, they will be allowed to be, they will be eligible for English 1. Um, that's, we'll come, I'll come back to that in a little bit, but this is what the results of that lead to. Um, the, the other thing that it led to is because we're getting data from the high school now directly, it allows us to pre understand where students will be placed on, as a consequence of their AP results. So we also have some students that will place higher than English 1 uh, automatically in the fall. But so the, the red bars right, the, is our traditional assessment system. This is what would have happened for these uh, roughly 1,400 students if they uh, 
uh, we're assessed and placed our typical way. We get about 1,700, I'm sorry, 170, that's roughly 12% of our population with assess in English 1, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40% um, with assess into uh, one level below. We don't assess anyone into, into two levels below. And then everyone else right, would assess into three levels below. We have some students that are still pending. That means they have essays that haven't been read yet, that kind of thing. But what happens is when we recognize the potential uh, utility of their uh, senior year English, um, things change dramatically. Right? And the, the first thing that you can see, or the thing that should be obvious, is we go from about 12% of students who are going to be eligible for English 1 to just under 50% of students will be eligible for, for English 1. Um, and the other thing that's nice about this is part of our pilot is in addition to having access to this, all of these students are getting prescriptive placement in the fall. So not only will all of these students be eligible for English 1, all of these students will be taking English 1 in the fall. Um, for math, it's not quite the same, but it's similar. So again, the red is our typical pattern. Uh, we don't have very many students that place at the transfer level. Uh, you know, we have more than intermediate algebra, and most of our students who uh, come through the math placement come through in algebra. A fair amount of pre-algebra and a fair amount in arithmetic are lower. Um, the math, um, let's see, how do we confirm their high school grades? I will come back to that. Um, that's an excellent question. Uh, I will come back to that near the end. Um, but for right now, uh, let's, I'm going to just keep going. And Brian, if I forget, um, don't let me. Um, and I'll come back to it later. Um, so for math, the way the pilot is going to work is there are two parts. If they have an A or B in any course, uh, they will be allowed to be eligible for the next course up in the sequence. So if you have an A or B in algebra in high school, or an A or B in geometry in high school, you will be allowed to take intermediate algebra if you choose. Additionally, there's a much more complicated model that the math department developed with uh, our help that allows any student whose probability of succeeding uh, uh, in a particular course is as high or higher than the average success rate in that course, they will also be allowed to take the course. So even if you have a C in intermediate algebra, if you're generally a good student, uh, you know, you have good grades, you have a good CST score, all of these things. Even if you have a C, you will be allowed to uh, into the transfer level math courses. So there are two parts of that pilot. It's a little bit more complicated. Okay, so that's what we're doing, how it's turned out so far. Uh, the next part of the presentation is the how. Um, I'm going to go through this relatively quick. Most of it's already available at RP. Um, but this would be a good time if you have specific questions um, to uh, you know, go ahead and raise them. I'll do my best to answer them. Or at the very least, I hope parents will help me collect them so that I can answer them uh, later offline if they would take more detail. Does that sound like a plan, Terrence? That does. In fact, if I guess I will um, I'll ask the first question, actually, the very first okay. question. Um, is, um, there was also a similar project at uh, Grossmont Kuriyamaka where they uh, um, had uh, students be placed into English courses based on their, their high school information as well. And they right. that for a couple of years. And I think Leif is on the call. And uh, maybe Leif um, could also um, help talk about how they were able to get the information on uh, you know, the high school transcript information as it's self-reported by students that they set up a local electronic transfer and see how that compares and contrasts with what you did at LDCC. Okay. Um, well, I mean, we can jump to that now. Um, uh, that's fine. Is, uh, do you think he, I don't see him on the call? So let me go ahead and explain what we're doing, and then um, then if he wants to jump in and can, then uh, go ahead. Um, so basically, what we've done is, in order to get the information from the high school, uh, every student completed a um, what we call a mutual responsibility agreement, where we pledge them what we're going to do for them as part of the program, and where they pledge to us what they're going to do, and where they give us permission to uh, they give permission to us to receive data from their district. Uh, in addition, for every student who's under 18, uh, those students' parents were contacted, and uh, they also had to complete an agreement. 
So if students don't complete, if students aren't willing to release their data from their high school district, then um, we can't do it. So that's the first step. We collect all these con uh, mutual responsibility agreements. We have parental consent forms for any students who are under 18. And then um, what we've done is we've worked out uh, a process with the, uh, the local high school district such that once we have those things in place, they will release the typical CalPAD file um, that has all the course information for the student uh, and linked to the California Standards Test information. Um, and so those things are things that they typically, they have to report them up to the state. That's why CalPAS can have them. And so they already have those things and data files that they can share. All right, so basically what they do is they take the students who we have permission or we've, who we've collected permission to, uh, to so that they can release the data to us, send it to them, and they prepare a, um, a data file for us. We get it and then we turn it into uh, custom educational plans for each student. Does that cover your question, Ryan? Okay, excellent. All right, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about the process. Uh, again, if anyone else has questions, just let us know. Um, basically, what we've tried to do is eliminate many, 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 many of the steps and headaches that we went through the trial and error um, to build this data set. Right? So we originally got the data from CalPAS last April. We started working on it uh, late over the summer. And it took us a couple of months to kind of get through to the process of understanding what we wanted to do with it, understanding what was in it, uh, working through all the little ins and outs of how to do the analyses. Uh, all, you're perfectly, uh, all of that opportunity exists for you. You can do all of those same things. What we've tried to do is distill it down to the things that if you wanted to do it as quickly as possible in an efficient and effective way uh, to streamline as much of it for you as we can. So uh, the way the tool is set up, there's a couple of things that you do need to have uh, available at your institution. Uh, you need to have Microsoft Access and you need to have uh, SPSS. If you do not have SPSS, you can obviously do the analyses in R or SAS. But we've written all the statistical syntax involved for SPSS. So you'd have to have someone at your institution who knows R or SAS or, or STATA to rewrite the syntax. That shouldn't be hard, um, but we don't have that expertise. And the other thing that you need uh, is you need at least some K-12 partners with active data sharing agreements as part of CalPath. And I think Terrence, uh, was he was talking to all of you as this process was set up, made sure that there was at least some of those in place. Um, one thing you don't need to do this project, but I think would be useful if you want to turn it into action, is to think about the K-12 districts with which your college or district has the strongest relationship. Uh, because there will be a lot of work that has to occur across the two institutions to make sure that this can happen successfully. So we spent a lot of time on the phone back and forth with them about how we can provide the contract to them, how we can develop the contracts, um, how to communicate to their students, uh, the change in our assessment. Uh, it's an ongoing conversation at a lot of levels. So the stronger the relationship you have with your K-12 partner, the more likely you'll be able to implement it on the back end. Now, you can still do the research, and I think one of the things the research can help with is to help build a stronger relationship. Right? If you do the research and say, if we can work together, look what we can accomplish for your students that might be very different from what we're doing now. Okay. So there's some key steps. I'll just introduce the tool very briefly, how to put it on your hard drive. I think probably most of you may have started with that, uh, how to acquire the CalPAS data if you haven't. The, there's really only, uh, let me keep going. So the step two will be just managing the data and access, getting access to basically take in all the files from CalPAS and create usable databases that SPS can then work, SPSS can work with. And then all you're going to do is get into SPSS and make some very specific changes in the syntax that match your local institution and then run the syntax. Um, the, the two parts where you will have the most work um, that will take the most time, and it's not a lot of time, but it will take the most time, is the underlying parts. So one thing that you'll have to do is because the data sets will be named differently for every institution when they come in, um, you'll have to rename the data sets. Right, so each of the CalPAS data sets will all have a name, and you'll just have to name it in a standardized way. 
we've provided as part of the tool uh, both uh, instructions and examples of how all those files would be named. As long as you match it, uh, then uh, all of those files will be used and created or turned into data. The last, uh, the, probably the most difficult step, and it's not difficult because it's hard, it's difficult because it's one of those things as uh, you know, researchers that you run into that you just have to make sure to do right um, to get things to work, but it, it doesn't take much thought, and so it's very easy to make simple mistakes. So um, because courses are named differently everywhere, right, so how you name your English courses and your math courses are different than how we name ours, and how your uh, local school district names their English and math courses and all of their courses is different. So what that will take is for you to go into the syntax and actually know the names of the courses at the different places, right? at your local district partner, at your school. Hopefully you can figure out the names of the courses at your school. But for your district partner, that's going to take some work. Right? So it's going to take a little bit of you know, exploring their website, talking to the partner about the names, uh, some actual exploration of the data that you get out. So one of the things that we found useful was just to do frequency counts on the course names. Um, so we got a sense of what the different course names in the data set were as a starting point. Key thing to watch out for there, um, it's not, or we didn't have as much problem with our institutional names, but at the high school level, names change, right? And it's not just the name. The course name may be the same, but in one year they may add a hyphen or a slash or omit a space or abbreviate it. So you just got to watch for possible course name changes over time. But everything else, most of that doesn't involve any work at all other than clicking some buttons and in the case of CalPass, waiting for the data to come back. So uh, to use the tool, you just need to make sure to drop it in your C drive at the, you know, just drop it right on your local disk. Uh, just use the same name. The, uh, uh, the tool relies on looking for it in that particular place. If you put it someplace else on a shared drive in your My Documents folder, uh, it won't work. So you just need to make sure to put it on your local disk uh, at, your, at the C drive level. All right. One of the things we've done is we've tried to make sure to cover a lot of ground, a lot of questions that you might have, what you might encounter, uh, the various information that you're going to generate, all of those things. Uh, and we try to create both an overall README, so you can see begin here. Um, I always encourage that. Uh, and then we have additional information for each step, right? So for the first step, how to get the data, how to manage the data, the second step, and how to use the SPSS to generate the final tables. Uh, also realize that you know we're there are going to be typos in there, so please be gentle. Um, we've done our best to provide this for everyone. Uh, so if you find typos, you know, please don't send us scathing, you know, why can't you spell these homonyms correctly? Um, if you would like to tell us so that we can fix them, that would be great. Um, but, you know, we're, we've tried to do our best to build this out for you within our normal constraints. Can I just get a show of hands how many of you guys um, have already collected your data or asked for your data from CalPath? Okay, so not too many. All right, so let me go ahead and go ahead and click your hands off this. Looks like we have maybe three or four. Um, so let me go ahead and go through this. Um, it's pretty straightforward, um, and Terrence can also speak to the um, ease of it. Uh, CalPass for us at every step of the process was amazing. So um, all you need to do is you log in at mycalpass.org. Uh, if you haven't already set that up, you need to talk to your CalPass administrator, um, whoever that is at your institution. Uh, if you do not have one, then uh, probably the best bet would be to talk to Derek afterwards about how to set that up. But it's pretty straightforward. So um, when you log in at mycalpath.org, there's a data menu. You can see it right here, slightly fuzzily, uh, that allows you to ask for to ask for data to be shared across institutions. Um, down here, you can see there's K through 12, community college, and the university. What you're going to do is click on these little pluses that expands the screen, so you can see both your partner and your institution. Right? So we just showed it, extended out. Um, you know, just pick whichever college you are. I would recommend that when you do that, it's going to show you the years. I would pull all the years, or at least a large subset of recent years. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is we're building 
uh, longitudinal cohorts with this process. So if you want to understand the relationship of high school information to students' performance in their first year at your college, that means you, data, you need data from the first year of your college plus two to three at least data, years of data from their time in high school. So the more years that you go across, the more likely you are to get enough power to do that. So I would recommend selecting as many as you can. Um, uh, you know, I, you don't, obviously ours goes all the way back to 1996. Our partners did not, so we went back as far as our partners' data went. Right? So this would be the K-12 breakout. Um, one of the things that I would probably recommend is um, many of you may need to go through this process multiple times because you want to do it with more than one K-12 through district. Uh, I think probably the best way to do it would be to ask for those separately. Right? So um, if you don't want to, that's fine, but that way you'll get those files um, individually uh, in a way that you can just go through this process in the same way each time. Otherwise, you'll just need to be much more careful about how you pull the files you get from CalPASS as you set it up. Uh, for people that are going to do that, that's probably something that we might uh, talk about at a later webinar or just have some discussions with them uh, uh, you know, offline. Um, one of the things you'll need to do is put in a data purpose. Um, I, we just put something, right, so you can name it whatever you want. If you want to name it your cool community college placement research, feel free. Just something brief so they understand w what you're up to. I, we just put this because that's what fit in the box. You can put a lot more there. Um, so I would explain what you're, how you're participating in steps and what you're trying to do is collect uh, information that will help you predict performance in English and math at the college level from performance in English and math at the high school level. And on the other hand, I think it's really great to uh, exceed its, its, its capacity if you type in too long of something in the job name. And uh, another question, should we do all partners? I would recommend, uh, I mean, if you're going in there, you're requesting a download, um, don't be shy. Uh, uh, grab, uh, you know, uh, make your request as broad as, as possible the first time out. Uh, as, um, uh, it's more efficient that way it's one request and then you don't have to go back if later you decide, oh, I really wish I had this other uh, tool. That's easy, John. Okay. Um, the one caveat I would say to that, I mean, that makes practical sense. Um, but you'll just need to be very careful when you get all these data files back, you're going to get a lot of data files. And right now, um, you will only be able to, uh, right now we've set up the tools so that all you do is you pull them all in. Right? So you'll have to use some discretion about which of your partner's data you pull in to run the tool against. Because right now, the way the tool works is it's assuming a single district. And you can run it again and stack those results um, or if you'd prefer, you can rewrite the syntax internally to take into account the fact that there might be different colleges. But right now, we haven't designed the tool to automatically stack the result. Does that make sense? Uh, hopefully that makes sense to everyone. So it's perfectly okay to grab all the data at once. Uh, that makes sense. But that just means that when you go to run the access uh, tool, you're going to want to just pull in the data for a single district at a time. Or you're going to have to rewrite the um, the underlying syntax that Access is using. Oh, just one thing: um, because you're building longitudinal cohorts, it's probably not a good idea to merge the files. Right? You have to remember you're pulling data, a whole variety of different things, uh, and then putting it back together. If it's put together beforehand, um, we're not sure how that's going to work. And one thing we do know is it won't work with the tool the way we have it set up. So leave that not click. Let's see, if we download multiple districts, can you split the file out afterward? Yes. So, when you, so what you'll see is when the data comes back, and so you can see here we, uh, we requested this data in April, um, you'll just get a whole set of data files that will identify the institution. Right? One of these will be your institution, and one of these will be, I'm sorry, this is uh, the partner institution, and then the other one will be identified as the high school information. And so they'll have the year, the academic year, and which file it is. So what you would have to do to break that out 
is just make sure that you're only pulling in uh, data for a single institutional identifier. Okay, um, I'm going to hold on to parsing the district data by individual schools to. From uh, I'll just answer that. The, it's easy. Of course you can. Um, the all of that information is in there. Um, we haven't set up the syntax to to run that, but um, that data will all be there. So what high school they went to, uh, what even in some cases if you have a long enough data set, um, you might be able to pull what middle school they went to. You'd have to build towards that over time. Though. Um, but yes, absolutely. Um, but what we found is that the effect of the high school for our district, and there's uh, very strong beliefs about which are stronger and weaker high schools, um, there were very little differences in the relative predictive utility of the different variables. Right? So there were no interactions between how the California standards tests or how grades predicted performance once people got to us. There was a very small main effect uh, for, uh, shoot, I forget, I think it was for math, uh, between a couple of the high schools where the overall performance, the, the, the overall performance was predicted to be lower, but the relationship between grades and the California standards test and institutional outcomes at college remained the same. That was not what we were expecting. We were actually quite expecting interactions, uh, but we didn't find any. So. That was actually interesting. Let me just leave it at that. It was very interesting. Um, so what you're going to get out uh, is a set of files, uh, a large set of files. So our set of files was roughly 2.4 gigabytes in total. Uh, obviously, the more years you do, the more districts you use, the more files you'll have, and the bigger it'll be. So most of you should have storage capacity for that, but keep that in mind. What's going to happen is you're going to get data back. For your institution, it's going to be almost exactly like MIS. You're going to get student information, which is essentially uh, your SD file. Uh, you're going to get course information, which is essentially your SX file, and word information, which is basically your SP file. Right. One of the things we don't do anything with in this uh, analysis or with this tool is we don't pull the award information in at all. But that information is in there. So uh, like I said, once you build this data set, there are going to be really interesting questions that you're going to be almost compelled to start trying to answer. For your participating K-12 districts, what you'll get is student information, all their course information, award information, uh, their CST scores, the demographics they give when they take the CST, uh, the CASI scores, the CASI demographics. Uh, the other thing that's also in there because of it's in the CST demographics is their results on the uh, early assessment program. So you can see their EAP flags as well. And um, you can see the full data element dictionaries at CalPath. So they describe what all the data are. Uh, what it won't do is it won't tell you what the individual course names are. You'll have to work with your local districts to find that out. All right. There's also uh, for the K-12, there's a, a field called course ID. And that contains what they call the CBEDS code, which is an acronym. Uh, and that CBEDS code uh, is kind of like a TOPS code, and it will uh, identify uh, the discipline of a course and can provide some additional detail. For example, it can differentiate between elementary algebra and intermediate algebra class. Uh, I've got some SPSS scripts for helping with that. I'm going to upload those to the Google uh, uh, site. Uh, that we set up for this project, or, um, or I can also uh, send that individually uh, via email. I don't think the tool is set up right now you know, to work with the feedback codes necessarily. And you also, there's data quality issues. Um, most K-12s now are pretty good about the feedback codes, but you know how it goes. I always get to double check. And the course titles are also helpful to know the course titles at your feeder high schools anyway. In English and math, because you even within a CBEDS category that identifies the math course as elementary algebra, you have different flavors of elementary algebra or intermediate algebra, for example. And John, you probably found that quite a bit while you were doing this project. Yeah, absolutely. So there are at least six different flavors of algebra at our partner. So they have regular algebra, they've got the algebra for students who uh, struggled in regular algebra. Um, and there's just a whole variety of different, like there's a shortened version of algebra, so there's a whole lot of things. 
in those types of issues. For us, uh, when Terrence first told me about that code, uh, which we missed, and it doesn't work for us because we don't have um, any, our district doesn't fill that in at all. They just basically use two different other codes for all of their courses. So for us, it didn't make sense to use it at all, unfortunately. This is just what the raw CalPath data looks like. Um, in step one, we help you walk through at the end what you need to name it, right? So this tells you, uh, for us, this is our, right, this is our identifier. This is the year. It's the student file. And so what we did is for the college, right, we put college in there. For the student file, we put that in there, and then for the year. And so we've created a file that tells you all the different nomenclature that you need to use in order to create the files that the tool can read. Okay. Um, so that that's maybe half an hour, and you just have to be careful. But it's not very hard. All right, so then you're just going to take all your data and rename it to things that the tool knows how to use and find. Uh, and then for access, all you're going to do is you're going to open up the access database. And it's really simple. All you need to do is work through it one click at a time. So you just import the college files, college student files, course files, student files, the CST files, the demo files. That's it. Um, and then once that's done, you know, it may take some time. Access is, will get potentially wonky as you start to build this because you're using lots of data. You create the queries that are basically going to pull and link all these files together, and then you're going to export these into different data sets that then um, SPSS can use. Right? And so all you need to do is just click one at a time and wait. Click and wait. Click one at a time at each time, at each time. So it's set up to be as straightforward as possible. Now there's going to be lots of missing data. So one of the things that we did do is we suppressed the error messages. Otherwise, there would be lots. It, this is designed for best possible world kind of thing, right? So if you have, for example, we have uh, a set of uh, looks like Rick is missing course information. If they don't have course information, if they don't have their course files, um, that you can still run this, but what will happen is all that course information will be missing. Right? So you won't be able to actually link any of their high school course performance to their college performance. This would still run. You would just end up with uh, this particular step would basically wouldn't pull anything in. Um, that would still allow you some information. Right? There's still some fair amount of information in these files about students' prior information, um, but uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and not, and probably not going to be as useful as getting their actual course information. Uh, Microsoft Access 2010 should be fine. Right? You're just going to walk through the steps. Okay. Uh, just kind of a word on choosing variables. What we've chosen um, is just what works best for us. We try to take the things that made the most sense and put them in there. There may be other things. Right? You may be able to pull other things into the process over time. Uh, you are more than welcome to do that. Right? And there are lots of very interesting things that you can do for sure. Um, it's just kind of a caveat answer kind of situation. Once you do that, um, I would just do that at the back end in SPSS. We have about 2,500 students arriving over five years. Um, and what we just looked at is their CST scores in English and math, their grades in English and math, their A through G course enrollments because they're supposed to be more rigorous, their GPA without English or their GPA without math, and then their senior year English course or their last math course. So at the SPSS step, this is probably the hardest step, right? Because at each of these, for you can see there's a, a number of different readmes here. I would go through those. I would recommend going through those in order because each one of those tells you what you need to do to take your local information and make it usable. Uh, so because all the courses are named differently, you've got to basically pull those things in. SPSS so that SPSS knows where to look for the AP English course or knows where to look for intermediate algebra. Um, and so what we try to do is highlight every step of this process for you. There's uh, 15 different places where you need to, 15 different sets of things that you need to kind of intervene to change. Um, and most of them all just have to do with knowing information about your partner districts. John, John, could you um, take a moment to just mention uh, uh, where the uh, files are, are available? We have a, a sorry, I guess I'm, I can do it now. Um, on the RP Group website, uh, we've got um, a project page set up 
for the Good Steps project, is what we're calling it. There's a link there to a Google site I've got as a staging area that has uh, files that you can download in a zip format uh, that uh, John is going through right now. And we'll, uh, at the end, uh, we'll put the URL up on the screen. Uh, you can also email either um, myself or, or John, and we can uh, email you back a link as well. Back to you, John. Okay. Um, so basically what you'll see when you go into these readmes is it will just tell you, and we've created bookmarks within the SPS syntax, so you can just jump to each one. Right, so here what you see is, oops, I lost my laser pointer. Right, here you can see you're going to need to change the variable, which is the high school course number. Um, you're going to have to find the PE range, because one of the things that we did is we just uh, uh, took out PE courses from the GPA calculations. Right. You're going to want to find the range of courses that refer to English, the range of courses that refer to math. Um, so for us, we were able to find those and put those in. You just need to be able to find them for your institution. And again, this might be something that you just uh, use that, the file associated with that guide to do a frequency analysis and see which are the course names or, or which are the course numbers, you know, sort them by number, find out which ones are English and not, and PE and math, et cetera. Um, but hopefully you'll have a good partner that they can help provide that information as well. Um, and so what you can see what we did is we tried to uh, create bookmarks so that you can stepwise through the associated SPSS syntax file and go straight to the points where you need to make changes. Um, when you get to the final analysis, um, it's pretty straightforward. You're just going to basically click on it and run uh, the entire file. What it's going to do is going to take all those changes you've made pull them all in, match them all for you, and then create one big data set um, that's just going to be amazing. And all we've designed is a couple of simple analyses for you. Um, there's going to be a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of really amazing things you can look at, but this is a great starter point. So what we've done is we've provided you with an ordinal logistic regression and a logistic regression. The first one just simply is going to um, Look, at, uh, try and understand what things predict placement uh, in the different levels of English at your college, and it's going to use high school information, their CSTs, their GPAs, um, their English specific. I'm sorry, their GPA without English, their grades in 11th and 12th grade English, and their A through G total units. You'll get very cool things. Hopefully, I'm hoping um, they've definitely been very cool for us. So. What, we, what you'll get is you'll get something like this. You'll get a number of additional tables, but the key thing is the parameter estimate. The first thing you'll see here is um, that it's predicting um, that are, it's harder to get into certain levels of English, right? So few, that's good, right? It's harder to uh, use our lowest level of English as a comparison. So getting into the middle one takes slightly more uh, higher um, results down here. And getting into English 1 requires a great deal of additional benefit along the way, a great deal of additional indication that um, you are prepared, essentially. So that's good. But one of the things that you can see right away, let's see how I have this stepped out, right, that the real powerful predictor, and we've already seen this from the earlier graph, is um, the CST in 11th grade English. Right? It dramatically captures the vast majority of the variance. Very little else is significant. Um, one of the things that does matter is AP English matters somewhat. The, your overall GPA matters a little bit, but your actual grades in English don't, right? Even your grade in 11th grade English is actually a, a non-significant negative predictor. That's not awesome. Uh, one of the things that we also did, um, so this kind of comes back to the question about can you tell the difference between different high schools? You can. Not include this analysis, but you could totally do it. But we also do look at the difference between different classes. All right, so we compared it to one of the more rigorous classes, which is uh, rhetoric and composition. And you can see a lot of their electives, those students actually are pretty good students. All right, there, there's a, they are more likely to be placed higher if they are in those electives, and AP has the largest effect. Remedial English, this is why we're not allowing A's and B's in a variety of the remedial English courses. Uh, that's actually uh, a negative predictor of placement. 
we also threw in uh, one of the things that we started seeing is because CSTs was working so strongly, we actually looked at mass CST. And mass CST is actually a pretty powerful predictor. Right? And you can see it has as much, uh, it's as big a predictor on placement in English as your overall GPA is, and it's much bigger than your grades in English are. Right? Which for a mechanism for placing students in the English seems problematic. Okay. So summary so far, and I see I have like four minutes to go, so let me try and summarize and wrap up and maybe tease you with the possibility of a future webinar. Um, what we have essentially is a system where what predicts placement for both English, we're just showing the English here, but math, is their 11th grade California standardized test scores. You could ignore a lot of what happens after that and still place them very similarly. Right. Alternatively, it's so strongly correlated, it basically looks the same as a test-retest correlation. Right. So you could almost do away with a standardized assessment at the college and just use their 11th grade California standards test results. That's how strongly they're related, at least for us. So um, basically what we do then is we just go from an ordinal logistic regression to a logistic regression, and now what we're just going to predict is likelihood of successfully completing uh, English or math. Right. Um, otherwise, the variables are the same. The one other thing we do add is the uh, course that you end up in, right, because that's obviously the higher the course that you take, the more difficult it will be to successfully complete. Right, so that's just the second analysis there. Basically, what we have is the, uh, a longer version of the graph I showed you earlier. Right, so what predicts how students do in English, how they did generally in high school, how they did in English in 12th grade, right? GSTs still matter a little bit, right? It doesn't mean they, it's not, they don't mean nothing, right? That standardized assessment is telling you something, but it's not telling you nearly as much as we think, right? What's telling us a lot about how students are going to do in the classroom is how they did in the classroom. What tells us a lot about how they did, how they're going to do in our placement and assessment is how they did on previous assessment, right? Here you can see our course effects, right? So, um, English 1 is where we're placing students here for this. And so, I'm sorry, uh, our lowest level. So it's much harder to get into English 1 and slightly uh, harder to get into um, our one level below course. And so um, I th what you're going to get out of this process is a set of analyses that will help you understand what the relationship is between what students do in high school and what they do in college and give you the opportunity to build a much broader, multiple, a truly multiple measure uh, assessment process, right? To really get a sense of students' overall level of preparation and motivation and determination and all of the things that go into course performance that may or may not be picked up by our typical standardized assessments. So I just want to take a couple of minutes to talk about what happens once you've done the research. Um, the first thing, uh, and I just lead off caveat, this process could be totally different at your institution, right? So this is based on my local understanding of what's happened, which may or may not be a good understanding of what's happened. Um, the first thing that you want to do is make sure that you build out the understanding of what you found, right? Start with you and your office. Do you make sure that you understand what it means, how to understand it, how to talk about of what a predictive model is, how to talk about logistic or ordinal logistic regression. Make sure you have that down cold. Um, what I found uh, to be an effective process, and this will be probably driven in part by whomever drew you into the STEPS project in the first place, um, would be to work your way uh, out from a core of people that you make sure understand what's going on pretty well. Um, so I found that uh, talking to the CIO and the CSSO was a very useful way both to help me to communicate what the potential was and also to get an understanding of what, what types of things I should focus on and what types of things I should ignore, what types of things um, made sense to people who weren't basically living in SPSS for two months and what didn't. Um, and then I think the process works best if you work that out a piece at a time. So if, you, if they understand and basically feel like it makes sense and it's worthwhile, then you work out to the academic deans and your matriculation or assessment coordinator 
to kind of talk about what you found and, and leave it pretty much at that. Right? Discuss the research. Um, don't talk about what necessarily you should do as a consequence of it right away, but discuss what you found. What does this mean? Help them work through how do I understand what this tells me about the students that are coming to our college? How does this help me understand how we might improve assessment and placement? Um, and then as you gain support, then you can bring those people uh, each, at each step to additional meetings. So, um, and, and that helps because they already know some of the information. They will provide contextual information that makes sense to them and their constituents. So you work your way out to larger and larger groups. Uh, you convince a small set of people initially, and then you work with them to talk to other people, right? And you essentially build momentum around the idea over time. Um, I think that works best. Uh, in uh, other cases, depending on your institution, it may not. I have a dash line here because one of the things, I, so this was the process that we went through essentially to um, share the research with the math and English departments. Right, and to the entire institution. But now, right, we're in the process of implementing it. And so it's really important to communicate what's happening, what the, what the pilot means, how that's going to change things for our students, to the people that are the students, to other department heads and other faculty and staff who are going to be having those students in other classes. Uh, Craig, your question, yes, so to recap, the data that you request from CalFast is all the data for all available years at least one of your major feeder districts uh, and all of your college files for the same years. Yes, that, that's the easiest way to do it. Um, and let me let me extend my thoughts on that with a um, just to let you know that, uh, that those of you who are invited, um, you know, I did look at your data availability ahead of time and uh, uh, make sure that, that hopefully you had at least the minimum amount of data. However, uh, some places like Long Beach City College have uh, an easy feeder like Long Beach you know, High School District or Chaffee College has Chaffee High School District. Some of you have much more complex situations, many more feeders uh, and data sets that might have bought. So uh, some of you might have, you know, you might not have as much data uh, and so there might be some additional you know, activities uh, associated with that. You might have to basically work a little a little harder on that, but uh, you know, if you run into any difficulties again, feel free to contact uh, me or John, and we'll help uh, help you uh, work through that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, whatever we can do to help, uh, just the the impact of this for our campus has been so enormously positive. Um, you know, we just want to help anyone else have that opportunity. Um, one of the things to keep in mind. Um, I know I forget this all the time. It's really important to know your audience. So one of the meetings I went into later in this process, uh, I went through some things very quickly that I shouldn't have. And uh, it turned out that um, it, I, I did not make certain that people understood what the difference between a correlation coefficient was and the uh, level of statistical significance that lets you know whether or not it's meaningful. Um, and so I made some assumptions about a degree of statistical sophistication um, that wasn't necessarily there. Uh, and so you just have to be prepared for that. Um, this just uh, I pulled this from a previous life when I was an instructor in psychology to try and explain what I'm aiming for in this. Uh, when you're trying to influence, you know, to share information with uh, other people, uh, the number of people that are engaging in the influence tends to increase the amount of influence that you have. So if you go as one person, I'm sorry, if you go as one person to a department, right, without other people that also understand, it makes it much harder. Your influence is diffused across all these targets. So the more sources that you have, the more influence you can have, the more, you, the more opportunity you have for the information that you've learned to change people's minds. Right? The strength of the influence matters for you as uh, people in institutional research or institutional effectiveness, your influence mostly comes from informational power. You know things that other people haven't found out yet, and expertise power, right? That you understand what this means. Um, the more other sources of power that you can generate, both through your own behavior and through convincing other people, reference power is people 
would like to listen to you because you're a nice person, you're generally outgoing. Legitimate power is power that comes from social reward. Uh, very few of us in our worlds have reward or coercion power. That's the ability to give good things and the ability to give bad things. Um, the other thing to highlight is immediacy is important. One of the things I've found is that when I've tried to talk to people about this over the phone, or I've tried to talk to you know go back and forth via email, it's very easy for people to not understand and for everything to be lost or misinterpreted. You've got to go out to the departments. You've got to go out to the people. You've got to go to them. Um, that's when you're going to get attention. That's when you're going to be able to address questions. Um, and then pay attention to the number of targets that you have at one time. Right? The more people that have not been exposed to it in the room, the harder it will be to explain what you're hoping to explain. So attend to, the, to your role and your audience. Um, one of the things that I try very hard to do is inform, explain, simplify, and distill. Be prepared to respond to questions. Be available. So I've gone to many, many departmental meetings, many, many sub-departmental meetings. And keep in mind that simple explanations are going to work better. Right? So for me, when I try and explain predictive modeling, uh, I usually try and talk to them about things like the weather. Right? Everyone understands you could understand the weather by looking outside, but that might not tell you as much about the weather you might want. So you rely on people with expertise to develop predictive models of what the weather is going to be like four hours from now so you can plan, or tomorrow so that you can plan. That's just predictive model. Right? It's doing the same thing as we're doing here. Um, another thing that I found works is just to talk about essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking all this information and combining it into one score. People seem to understand that. Right? So I'm adding this all up and they all have different weights to tell me how it best predicts the outcome we're looking at here. Right? In a very simplistic way, that's kind of what's happening in regression. Uh, but in a way, and so then what you say is but we're doing it in a way so we can see each one's contribution. Uh, that seems to be something that works well for people who otherwise don't understand regression very well or predictive analytics. For me, I think the, the thing that was very revealing, uh, and as a long time educator myself, uh, really kind of resonated, there's a very simple explanation of the basic effect that we saw. The best predictor of performance in the classroom is performance in the classroom. Right? The best predictor of performance on standardized tests is performance on standardized tests. Right? That helps people understand that this is not some really challenging, difficult, I mean, all that stuff is true, but at the heart of it is a very simple idea. That if you want to understand how students are going to do in the classrooms at your college, the most relevant information you have is how they did in similar classroom contexts before college. If you want to understand how students are going to do on a standardized test in a couple of hours, well, a good predictor of that is how they did on a very similar standardized test in the past. The other thing that I found very effective was to make sure to touch upon what most people recognize is not working now. So everyone understands the point of assessment and placement, that what we're trying to do with assessment is place students in their zone of proximal development, right, where the appropriate level of challenge is meeting the level of skill that they have. That's where the most learning happens. Um, and what people feel, right, is they have a system right now where students are getting into courses that are too high for their level, right? And then are also frustrated by students that are obviously good students but are being placed too low. And one of the solutions to that generally has been, well, we really need to deal with the problem of students that are being too high, so let's increase the cut scores. Let's raise them up because we've got to keep those students, those students that are struggling because they're being placed too high. Um, we need to get them placed more appropriately. So obviously our cut scores are too low. But the problem is it's not that the cut scores are too low. They're just not as strongly related to what you want performance as you would like. Right? So what I try to do is just pull that into the understanding of the zone of proximal development. So right, this is where we're trying to put students with assessment in place. This is the whole point of it. Right? We're trying to find students at their level of competence and put them at the appropriate level of challenge where with support from the instructor they can learn the most. If we place them too high, right, this is where students are likely to fail. The challenge is too much for them. They're going to be anxious. They may be angry. If we place them too low, you get boredom and disengagement. Right? You put them, this is a student. We, so one of the things that helped generate some support is we could find roughly 20 to 30 AP students who had gotten A's and B's in AP English who are getting placed into our lowest level of English remediation. Right? They are not 
going to be happy there. They're going to disengage from education and they leave the institution. So what we're trying to do is get as many students in this zone as we can. And the problem we have is we have an assessment mechanism that only has a slight positive correlation between placement and performance. Instead of having this nice strong correlation, what we have is a lot of students here who are being placed too high and a fair number of students over here that are being placed too low because there's just not the relationship between what we're using to assess and place students and, and performance that we would like. Sorry, that's a very clunky um, graph, but it is what it is. So one of the things that I think helps faculty, other administrators to understand is trying to point to those particular things. When we've looked, we have about one-third of our students who are being placed in the transfer level English by these standardized assessments that we can tell are not likely to do well. Right? They got C's, D's, and F's in their last English class and are generally not very good students. They, get, you know, they have C averages that are lower in high school. They're really not likely to succeed, but they're getting in there based on this assessment. Uh, and then there are a fair number of students that are even placed one level below that are not likely to succeed. And then we have a huge number of students that are placed three levels below that are likely to succeed at one of the higher levels if they're placed there. Right? So this is uh, from one of the presentations that I did. I just tried to map that out for people. Right? Kids with A's and B's are pretty likely to succeed at transfer level. Uh, and this is the breakdown of placements given grades. These students are ones that are probably likely to do okay. Right? They're very likely to do okay. That are not, they're being placed very low in our developmental sequence. These students are ones that we have some real serious doubts about um, and are not likely to do well. But because we have this lack of correlation, these students are getting into English 1 and these students are not. Right. Um, this is where I typically also talk about the gross Lock cream maca uh, where they use a very similar system. Um, we looked a little bit at ethnicity and gender initially um, and found um, very small effects except in the case of African American students. Uh, but again, what we found is no interactions between the predictive utility of the predictors. Right, so there's a main effect that's not surprising in our school because we see this basically every time we look. Uh, African American students are uh, somewhat less likely to successfully complete uh, courses or overall success rate. Um, so that comes out. But it's not the case that uh, an African American student with an A is less likely to succeed than other students with A's. Right? There's a main effect to some extent with ethnicity, but that A is still very meaningful. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Uh, this is a, I, I'm, if, in case it wasn't clear, I'm new to webinars, so I don't, it's hard for me to deal with the questions from people who uh, don't have uh, answers <laughs> or the, the ease of answering. Uh, the last piece of advice I'd point to would be to be prepared. Um, there, you're going to get a lot of questions. So make sure that you understand your developmental sequence pipeline. Be prepared to be able to explain what it currently looks like, what the consequences of that are. Talk about what that means for things like success rates and persistence and achievement of outcomes. And then one of the things you want to be able to say is there will be a time when people will ask you, so okay, you've shown me all this information. What would you do? I would wait till you're asked that. But you should be prepared for someone to ask you that. Um, and so you should think about what you might do with this information. Um, I just put together the, the CCRC is a great resource for background information. Uh, I highly, highly recommend reading the two recent papers by Scott Clayton and Jaggers and I'm sorry, and Belfield and Crosta. They actually got coverage in the New York Times, and so that's a nice little summary that you can use to provide to people to help them understand and uh, also provide essentially look other people are thinking about this and looking at this too. And another good source that probably many of you are familiar with is uh, what Katie Hearn and Myra Snell have been doing at the California Acceleration Project. They've got a lot of information at their website here, and there's a great little tab called the Get Started tab, which is a great place to get started. And I think Terrence, if I'm correct, the plan is to make these available, the slides available to people so they don't have to write all this stuff down. Is that right? Yeah, this is uploaded on the, uh, the Google uh, site that we've got. And just as a note on that, the Google site uh, will be, uh, the materials on that as the project develops will be migrating over to the, um, you know, the regular RP website as well. Uh, so uh, you can, uh, I provided that URL earlier and you can use that as your, 
um, beginning place, and then uh, we'll, we'll move uh, you know, as the project uh, progresses and we get uh, briefs, for example, and other um, um, interesting related uh, articles or, or other materials. We'll be putting more and more up on that site. Feel free to make any suggestions um, uh, there. And also, um, you know, we are. Uh, we did say an hour is a big topic. We are you know, a little over time. I see that most people are hanging in there, which I appreciate. Uh, but we will be, you know, um, we want to. Uh, we're we're here uh, for you guys to uh, you know respond to any questions that you have. But I I know people have already been feeling free to go off to their their lunch or other meetings uh, as needed. But we'll be wrapping up here pretty soon. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so that's where we'll be uh, uh, putting the resources up on that uh, URL that I provided earlier. Back to you, John. I feel like this is kind of like a, I've always wanted to be a newscaster. Back to you, John. <laughs> Excellent. Um, yeah, so this, I think, would be a good time. Um, I, I do have a little bit more to share, but I think cause I think you've made a good point. We've taken a lot of people's time. Um, if people have specific questions we'd like us to address at this point, um, I'm happy to do that. But otherwise, I'll, I'll go ahead and keep going. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll just go ahead and uh, just try and quickly finish up. So the last thing that we built is something to help prepare you for um, what happens if they ask, well, what would you do now? And so one of the things that we built into the tool at the end of the SPSS syntax is how to estimate the student's probability of successfully completing a course. Um, and so basically what it will do is it will take the results of the analysis and all the different uh, predictors and generate the probability of success in a particular course. It's a pretty straightforward process. It's the last thing down here, placing students using the model. And all you're going to do is you're going to pull the coefficients from the different parts. Uh, you might even recognize some of these coefficients from the English model from before. Um, you're just going to pull those in in order to have SPSS compute the probability of successfully completing English um, based on the uh, variables. So what it will do is it creates this highlights all the coefficients that you need, and it pulls for each student right the information that they have. What was their English? Uh, what was their GPA without English? What was their English grade in 12th grade? What was their 11th grade English? What was their CST? And it pulls that all in and weights it for your local model. All right, so basically, what we have is the overall constant. That's the, the GPA coefficient. The ones for grades. The ones for the CST, the A through G, you can see that's really small. Um, the different course fix effects, right, and then the course difficulty coefficient. That what we're doing here is we're doing the probability of, of successfully completing English one, and then for each student, then what that does is it's going to generate a probability, and then we provide one more thing, right? That is to allow you to set up placements based on that. Um, what we have been using typically as uh, something that everyone seems to resonate with is a probability of success that's equal to or greater to than the average success rate in that course. Right? So if you can show that these students are, likely, are more likely to succeed than the average student in the course, everyone seems to be okay with the fact that they should be allowed to take the course. Um, so you could put that in here if you like. right? What we did here is we just assumed 70% any student who was likely to complete English 1 at a 70% or higher level, we, for this particular example, put into English 1. And then you can just change that probability for however you want to do the placement. That would be something that you can play around with yourself. That will be something that you would uh, use at the end of the process when you're working with the departments. Um, but this is the process by which that you can take results of your analyses and generate placements. Um, so to close, I think what I've tried to do is suggest that there are ways that by using high school information, you can give them more appropriate targeted access to their transfer level coursework. You can increase the success rates in your developmental courses, students achieving intent to transfer within the first year, I'll increase the number of students who attain meaningful outcomes, and change the understanding of our students. Now, one of the things I think has been really remarkable for me is that it actually changes the way we think about our students. We've been talking about uh, at Long Beach City College for the last decade how 80 to 90 percent of our students require developmental remediation, and a lot. So our average developmental course load is about five and a half to six. 
if we did a full use of this method, we could reduce that to roughly two to two and a half semesters. Um, so we reduced the developmental course load in half, um, which really changes how you think about whether or not your students are in fact ready for college in ways that people weren't willing to consider before. So um, I also, one of the other things that I'll include, oh, so if you do use the tool, we just would appreciate if you cite the tool. Um, that's also in the README. Um, and one of the things I've done is just provided some of the other things that I've used to try and explain to people what's going on with developmental pathways. Right, so here's our fast path through math. But we also have a slower path through math on just trying to demonstrate what that type of thing would look like, some graphs from other CCRCs. So that will all be here uh, for your use if you want to think about how you might include that in your, as you're communicating to people. Um, uh, other than that, uh, that's all I have. And so I know we're at minus 23 minutes left, um, so, but I'm willing to stay on as long as people have questions. Great, thank you. What I'm just going to do um, is uh, keep, uh, we're still recording. I'll keep the recording up another couple minutes, and then I'll go ahead and turn it off if there's other questions as well. Um, if anyone have any questions, they'd like to make sure to record it for posterity. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and turn the recorder off at this uh, uh, time. Thank you all for uh, participating uh, in the webinar.